Okay, thanks everyone for coming out to the talk, and thanks for the department for inviting me to give the talk. I'm Taylor. I'm a recent uh, appointed as a lecturer in the electronic engineering department here. But I've actually been at uh, UCL for several years, so five plus years, and I've been working in, uh, in the labs in the London Center for Nanotechnology. So I'm going to tell you about um, our atomically precise fabrication technique and how we're applying this to quantum technologies. So this is a review of some work over the last several years and then where we go with this now in the future. So basically, I'm gonna tell you about this atomic scale fabrication technique that I have illustrated here schematically, where we use a sharp metal probe to manipulate individual atoms on the silicon surface and how we use this to hopefully make some exciting um, quantum information devices. Okay, so this, my side of all this is the fabrication. So I developed the fabrication. I'm a surface scientist by, uh, by training. So this talk really can be, we could summarize it as a story of the ultimate miniaturization of the transistor. So here we have uh, Moore's Law, everyone's be familiar with, I'm sure. And um, here we just have the examples of even pre-Moore's Law, the very first monolithic integrated circuit with four JFETs and the, the whole, the whole uh, crystals about five millimeters across. Then, um, whatever this is, some, uh, 55 years later, we have the 14 nanometer node for the Intel FinFET. And this is an amazing accomplishment of human technology. We're talking the, um, the reason we now have, rather than a thousand, we have 10 billions of uh, transistors is because we miniaturized and scaled the transistor. So in these 50 years, we're looking at like making this thing like a million times smaller. But this, the industrial roadmap for semiconductor technology stopped in 2017, and some say that Moore's Law has come to an end. This is basically because the miniaturization hits the physical limits of miniaturization. We're down now to the atomic scale. In this FinFET, the, the channel's eight nanometers wide across. We're talking something like 20, 20 atoms across in the channel. Okay, but this is not at the single atom level yet. And what I'm gonna tell you about is a technique where you can really make devices at, at the single atom level. So, this technique, which I'll tell you about in a few, a few times in varying degrees, is using a scanning tunneling microscope to manipulate atoms on the surface of a silicon crystal. Then we control where dopants go, and we can do it down to the single atom level. Here I have an example of 50 atoms. This is all done in the microscope in ultra-high vacuum. And then we pull it out, and we use standard microfabrication techniques to contact this thing. And what we have here is an example of a single electron transistor that's built in this way. And here we've got 10, the, the, the active area in this single electron transistor is 10 by 10 nanometers, but one atom thick. And this can actually be taken all the way down to a single atom as the active, the active uh, element in your transistor. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about and how, how we use this. And it really represents the, the final limit in scaling of transistors. Not that this can be applied for monolithic integrated circuits, but it's the smallest transistor you can make in silicon. Okay, so if we think about scaling transistors, um, we can look at this fairly well-known paper from uh, Asinov, came out in 2009 and looked at problems that were coming in scaling of, of transistors. So pre-2000, when you have a 100 nanometer channel width and the channel's doped at 10 to the 18 dopants per cubic centimeter, you can think of this as uniform material, with uniform density of dopants in the channel. Now, in the 2000s, when we started to get smaller than 100 nanometers, the granularity of the material starts to come into play. And the number of dopants in the channel becomes 10 to the 3, 10 to the, 10 to the 2. This now starts to become important for the device operation. And this paper was looking at what happens when you go beyond, when you get down below 10 nanometers at this doping density, you now have single digits of dopants in the channel. This is a problem. It's a problem for reliability in your transistor. It means that, for example, the threshold voltage can be moving around. You can have short channel effects, various problems. So this paper was exploring what we could do about this. And in reality, in the, in the real 2020s, there's been 
new types of architectures that have mitigated some of these problems. These are the FinFETs, move away from the planar, planar um, structures and go to FinFET and gate all around FETs. But you still have a tiny number of dopants in, across the width of this channel. It's still problematic and we can only go so far. But this doesn't have to be just a problem, right? We're getting down to the level where we've got individual dopants in the channel and um, we can exploit this. So it's just a quick preview. I'm going to talk to you about this Kane quantum computer proposal, which looks kind of similar to this field effect transistor where we have few numbers of dopants in the channel. And we're going to exploit using individual dopants in our transistor, essentially. So before I do that, I'll do my, the quick, quick cursory uh, discussion of what a qubit is and what we need to make a quantum information device. So I think if anyone's familiar with the idea of quantum computers, you've seen all this before. It's the same standard cursory discussion. Basically, the classical bit is off or on, zero or one state. That's it. Your transistor's off or on, depending on the polarity of it. Now, in a quantum bit, you have this one and zero state, but you also have a superposition of the, of the one and zero states, depending how you prepare your, your um, quantum object. This is a two-level system, and we represent it here by the wave function, which has these alpha and beta terms, which are the probability density that it's in either the zero or the one state, and these can take any complex value, and you get some mixture of these. This is called superposition. This is what we're manipulating. This is what we're exploiting quantum mechanically when we, when we build a qubit and make a quantum computer. The other property we use is entanglement, so you can start to entangle these two-state systems and build up a more complex system where now we have many more of these probability density terms that starts to scale as two to the n. This is where you potentially can exploit this um, exponential scaling of the superposition of the qubit states. And you develop clever algorithms that let you um, do parallel calculations in a way that exploit this, this exponential scaling, whereas in the classical computer, the number of states you can represent is scaling linearly with the number of bits. So this has all kinds of uh, proposed applications, and who knows what the other applications are if we can actually build this thing, right? There's many possibilities here. These classic proposed applications all have to do with exploiting this large number of states that can be represented. So you have, for example, optimization problems. This is the classic traveling salesman problem. It's quantum many-body simulations, security and encryption, and big data analysis with possible applications in machine learning. Okay, so all that said, this is why we might want to make this thing. Um, and it turns out that an individual dopant in a silicon crystal is a good um, candidate for this. So when you have an individual dopant in silicon, we get... Uh, two spins. You get the electron spin and you get the nuclear spin. If you put a magnetic field, you Zeeman split these and now you can use this as your two-level system. So there was a proposal in 1998 by Bruce Kane that said if you can position individual dopants in silicon 20 nanometers apart, 20 nanometers below the surface, put some gates on, add some uh, AC and DC global magnetic fields, cool it down, then you could make a, a quantum computer. I won't go into the details exactly how this works, but let's say that um, the ch this is the challenge now to try to position individual dopants in silicon with atomic precision. There's many benefits of doing this in silicon. The silicon environment, silicon 28 has no nuclear spin, meaning it's a magnetically clean environment, and we can isotopically purify silicon. So it's a very quiet environment. This caches out in long coherence times for your qubits. And that means that the initial and final states are correlated over these lengths of time. And these are quite long for dopants in silicon. Here's just the state of the art developing this. So let me just move along quickly to get to the, there's various proposals where you can, if you can position individual dopants in silicon, you could build a quantum computer. And they're using different, either nuclear or the electron spin, and different ways of entangling these qubits, either exchange coupled or dipole coupled. And as we get to more sophisticated ones or different ones, we relax the requirement of exactly how well we need to position the, these dopants. But even when you do that, you still need to know where they are. So if we can fabricate with atomic precision, we can know where they are, and we can um, 
we can potentially build some of these different, these different schemes for a quantum computer. A simpler version of things, much, not much fewer, we're talking 10 to the 6 in these quantum computer schemes, with few doping atoms, we can build what are known as analog quantum simulators. And these are where we model systems that we're interested in by building them out of dopants and silicon. And now we're looking at many body uh, quantum systems. And we can do this with few numbers, tens of atoms. And we can start to explore interesting condensed matter physics problems that we couldn't do before. So how are we going to do this? We use the scanning telling microscope. Basically, we reach out and touch the atoms with our finger. Our finger is a metal probe. This was developed in 1980 at IBM Zurich and exploits quantum tunneling. Basically, the electron quantum mechanically can be on the other side of a potential barrier. It can go from the sample into the tip and it decays exponentially. This means that you can measure the position of atoms by, by measuring where their electrons, electrons are with below atomic precision. Here's the first paper. Here's where they imaged the first image ever of real space atoms on the surface of a piece of silicon. That's a cardboard cutout set on a lawn with a photo taken, but this is basically a milestone and a key enabling step in developing nanotechnology. Here's a more modern version where each individual dot is an atom on a silicon surface. Okay, there's some details of how this works. Tip, sample. Here's a nice, clean, perfect silicon surface. And it all goes in a, in a stainless steel chamber at ultra-high vacuum. I'm going to have to move along quickly because I think I'm... Okay. So here's how we do the work. Put the tip next to the sample, raster it, measure where the electrons are using quantum tunneling. So in the early days, they realized you couldn't not, not only just measure it, but you could also manipulate the surface. Here's some famous examples. This is uh, a number of xenon atoms on a nickel surface to spell out IBM from 90. Here they build a famous quantum corral where we can see the electronic wave functions trapped in a ring of individually positioned iron atoms on the copper surface. This is done one by one by either pushing or picking up the atoms and putting them into position. Here's the steps along the way to building this quantum corral. It's tedious and it's all done at low temperature in ultra-high vacuum and it's um, a very susceptible system. Now, if you're really patient, you can move them around over and over again and make a cute little movie out of atoms. The boy and his atom that came out in, oh, I don't know the year, I think it's about five years old now. But these are all just toy systems in the lab demonstrating that you can move it around. More recently, there's more sophisticated build a memory. Here's a, kilo, here's a rewrite of atomic kilobyte on a surface of copper, written in individual atom vacancies. Binary, here they spell out the word Feynman. But even this is at 77K and only exists in um, ultra-high vacuum. So if we want to fabricate in silicon, we need something that works at room temperature. This is the same surface I showed you before, silicon uh, pristine atomically clean surface, but it's covered in hydrogen. If I look closer, these bright spots are missing hydrogen atoms. This is where the surface is reactive. Everywhere else, it's unreactive. You can use the STM tip to pattern this with atomic precision. Here we remove single hydrogen atoms. Here we draw a perfect block. Each of these rows is a row of, of dimers of, of atoms. And we can turn up the current and we can do larger scale. But it's still quite slow. OK, so now we put this together and here's the technique to do the patterning. Start with atomically clean silicon, put a layer of hydrogen on the surface, use your tip to remove the hydrogen, now we ex expose it to a particular precursor, phosphine, which absorbs, dissociates, and then your atom incorporates into the top layer. Now you carefully overgrow this with epitaxial silicon, and your silicon's trapped, your perfect atomic scale pattern's trapped in your silicon, you can take it out of the UHV and it will be stable forever, basically. So here we just show the steps. Here we draw the dot and we dope it with phosphorus. This can be phosphorus. We've recently developed this to do with arsenic as well. So you can start mixing the species. And there's an ongoing work to add new materials to this. So here's a device that we've made recently in our lab using phosphorus and silicon. This is a multi-single electron transistor all in parallel. We vary the size of the dots. We vary the gaps. And these are our Coulomb diamonds, where we get um, 
We have block, coolant blockade of transport between the source and the drain through the dot. And we, ra we raise the level of these quantized states in the dot by applying a bias on the in-plane gate. And we get either tunneling through the available states or we get it blocked. And it goes from on to off to on to off. And as we move up the source drain bias, we can explore excited states in the dot and leads around it. OK, so now we follow this. In, so we're following the work of the University of New South Wales, where they developed this. And they've not only done a single electron transistor, they've done it with a single atom in the center. They make a single, a single atom wide wire, they make a two-plane device, and they make actually a two-qubit quantum gate using silicon. This is all the ingredients you need to make this surface code error-corrected solid-state quantum computer. How many minutes left? They just get to the good, here's the good bit. The punchline. So it turns out there's a problem in phosphorus. If you want to put a single phosphorus atom, you need a certain size hole in the resist, which is what these represent. But you only get a single phosphorus atom 70% of the time. This is no good if you want to actually scale up to millions of qubits. The answer to this is arsenic. Arsenic has different surface chemistry, the precursor, arsine does. And this is a demonstration where we clean out holes absorb uh, the precursor molecule, and we get a perfect two by two single atom lattice. This is the first example of, of a perfect two by two lattice done in silicon ever. This is the most precise fabrication done, done in silicon, which we did in our lab over in the LCN. So this works because the chemistry is different for, for our scene. And, I, and I, here's some of the data that shows how this works. What we found is that if you make a four silicon lattice site in the resist, you always absorb a single moiety of arsine, which is the precursor. And every single time you heat it up to incorporate, you get one arsenic atom. And this can be pushed up to 100% yield. Here in the paper, if you want to read it, we cite 97 plus minus 2, but there's a way to push this to 100. We got a patent application on this one. OK, so now using this, we're starting to build some stuff. I showed you this idea for an analog quantum simulator. Here we try to build it. We get pretty good. Um, incorporation rate, we get 80% of these 16 lattice sites, and that's without trying too hard. If you try to do this in phosphorus with the best lithography, your best you'll do is 70%. Okay, and now because we can put individual atoms wherever we want them, we now are, and they're indistinguishable, we have a scheme, we'll leave this as like a teaser, we have a scheme to do uh, entangling using measurement-based entanglement, which relies on the indistinguishability of these qubits when you measure them. Okay, sorry if I went over. Here's everybody that was involved. Upshot is we can do single atom fabrication. We can, con we, instead of traditional electronic materials where you have disorder at the atomic scale, we can make perfectly ordered arrays in silicon using dobins. Thanks. Thank you very much, Taylor. Um, questions, quick, one quick question again, I think we have time for. No questions. Oh, um, at the back. I'm going to go. Sorry, Julian. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. You can hear me. Um, can you talk a little bit about the prospects for scalability? Um, I assume you're talking very much about making single devices at the moment. What are the prospects actually for trying to, to scale this up? So, yeah, there's, um, I think that, so, Scanning probe fabrication is, you know, by many people's estimation, unscalable, right? This is a serial process, and there's all kinds of problems with it. Uh, I think a standard answer you would get is parallel probes, and maybe you know this millipede project at IBM. This has been tried, and with some good success in the past. We have many probes operating in parallel. Um, but I think there's other ways beyond that approach, and I'll just say, there's a possibility to harness the, um, to harness nature's organization on its, on its own that might allow us to do some scalability. We have, we have ideas how to reduce the amount of, of atomic scale fabrication you need to do. And if instead we just need to know where the atoms are, still use the atomic resolution of the microscope, then maybe there's some hope here to do some scaling. Sorry if it's a bit vague, but this is some of the ideas we've got. Thank you.